My son-in-law has gone missing. He just disappeared into thin air. He just wouldn't simply walk away. I don't believe you're taking this seriously at all. Susan, there is always the possibility he may not want to be found. We had to call a doctor yesterday to see her. She's not eating. No, sorry. And she's walking herself into exhaustion every day. Daddy, I think it's his heart. Oh, someone for my special relationship with the commissioner. Oh, it's just what I wanted. It's a girl. Just, just get out, please. Just leave me alone. She's on the verge of a nervous breakdown. I did everything you told me to. I'm on my own, I swear to you. Yes, I'll be there. Something happened this evening, and... Well, I know that Mark's alive. Hello, Susan. Okay, last but not least, we need to trace this man as we now have him on two separate sections of CCTV footage and both times he's got his plaster cast on a different wrist. Um, okay, listen, I don't want this information to leave this office. I do not want the press to get hold of it, but uh, we're hoping that he's not, as Lisa's suggesting, emulating the American serial killer, Ted Bundy. Okay, this is a computer-generated image of how he may look minus the wig. We made his hair receding and darker due to the colour of his eyebrows. But this is just an impression. He may have more hair or less. My office now, Satch. Have you had any breakfast? Yes. Where are you going? Just going for a walk. I'll be back shortly. Wait, I'll, I'll come with you. No, just wait here. I'll be on my mobile. Susan, are you meeting someone? Just going for a walk. You've been late every day this week, Satch. It isn't on. You know, if you need paternity leave, just take it, for Christ's sake. I need everybody working flat out this week. I'm sorry, it won't happen again. I was just walking out of the flat and she projectile vomited all over my suit. DC Connor. Mike, yeah. OK, I'll get someone over there now. Thanks. Uh, Susan's mother just called Walker. She's worried. Susan left the hotel maybe to meet someone. Susan Harrington's done a disappearing act. Great. Is she still not answering her mobile? No, I switched off, so we can't even ping it. Oh, stupid girl. If someone tried to contact her, why didn't she tell us? Mrs Thorpe said she rang her last night on her way from Heathrow, but when she got to the hotel, Susan was out. Didn't get back for five minutes, and when she did, wouldn't say where she'd been. So she could have made a phone call she didn't want us to monitor. This morning, she asked the doorman of the hotel the best way to get to Teddington. But her mother insists she doesn't know anyone in Teddington. Although she was dressed up as if she was going to meet somebody. Maybe another crank? Susan? Susan Harrington? Yes? You said 9.15. I've been here for ages. Sorry, I got held up. Do you want to walk with me? Oh! Did Tom say he wasn't going to be in this morning? No, the fruit was all ready to put out, so he must have been in. Or maybe he's gone to get something for the cats. What cats? The ones out back. He said they'd been piddling on the crates. Yeah, I know. It smells been really bad lately. When he gets back, ask him to call me. 
Oh, I'll take some of these cherry tomatoes, Eddie, dear. Please. Please don't let this be some kind of sick joke. I won't go with you unless you give me some more details. Didn't you get enough last night? No. No, I need to know more. This is your husband, isn't it? Then if you want to know where he is, walk with me. There's a lot more I can tell you. Do you know where he is? Yes, I do. I can even take you to him if you're a very good girl. Here, hold on to me. You see, I'm putting myself at risk even agreeing to meet with you. But I did agree because I trust you. Oh, you can trust me. And I swear before God you can trust me. I've, I've told no one. I swear to you. Look, I just need to know if you can take me to my husband. I can. I'll pay you whatever you want. Anyhow you want. I just need to know. When you say you can take me to him, does that mean he's still alive? Maybe. You see, I'm on very dangerous ground here because of what I'm telling you. Did you take him away? <laughs> yes, of course I did. But I now feel sorry for you, which is why I contacted you. I don't want money. I'm doing this out of kindness. <laughs> but you kidnapped him. Why would you do that? What if all this is just a pack of lies? Is he dead? You're asking me more and more questions, Susan. I told you not to do that. Please, I need to know. Please. I just want to see my husband again. You can. I can take you to him, but I have to protect myself. You have to understand that. You know what I look like now. You could have me arrested. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Please. Please, don't do this to me. I just want to see him again. All right. But you have to agree to a few things just to protect me. I'll do whatever you want. OK. But you could be wired. How do I know that you're not? I'm not. I'm not. Under your coat. Let me see. Callers using the phone nearest the hotel around 10:20. One call to Clapham Junction, another to Hounslow, but the third one's to Teddington to another phone box. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, if she arranged to meet someone, they're not going to use the wrong phone. And if whoever she she did talk to wanted to meet, well, they're going to do it close to their place. Well, it's timed at 10:25, which is within our time frame. Okay, I need you to check out the railway station in Teddington, please. No, we start a house-to-house -house search of the area. I'll head in as many offices as I can for you. You don't think that we should see how this pans out? Waiting's over. We get moving. That stallholder said that she deals with thespian types. He wears a wig. He may just try his hand at acting. We start with local amateur dramatic societies. We take Teddington Station as a centre of operations and fan out from there. Let's get moving. Getting cold feet? Think about my position. You now know what I drive, so if I hadn't decided to trust you, this would be madness. I said I'd do anything you want, and I will. You know I'm not wired up. I've told you nothing but the truth. Get in.
Give me your mobile phone, Susan. That's one of the rules. I had it turned on. I just... just switched it off. Naughty. You just lied to me. You switched it on. Don't try and be clever with me, Susan. Now for rule two. It'll be up to you. If you don't agree, I'll make you get out of the van. What are you doing? Do you want some coffee? No. I think you do. Or the deal is off. Drink it. And you'll be with your husband in 15 minutes. What if I don't? You'll never get to see him again. It's just something to make you drowsy, so I'm protected. I have to protect myself, Susan. You love him, don't you? Yes. Then do it for Mark. It's the only way, Susan. I can't take the risk. I have to protect myself. I'm only doing all this because I feel sorry for you. Eddie? Right, your mum was here, asked where you were. She took a pound of cherry tomatoes, but I didn't put it in the book. Don't bother, Eddie, I'll do it. You can take off now, I'm back. I work until five today. So I'm giving you a break. Take it, and I'll see you at the weekend. OK, whatever. You know where I am if you need me, don't you? Do you get something for the cats? What? Your mum said you were worried about a smell of cats out the back. Oh, yeah, sorted. Bye then, Eddie. Where are you going? Just going to get my coat. Are you sure you don't need me? You've got your good clothes on. I'm sure. You get off now, Eddie. There's a good lad. Well then. Yeah, bye. <sighs> all over again. Yeah, but we go on. Lisa. No joy yet from the dramatic societies. We have another one to go, but it's in Shepparton. Do you want me to check it out still? It's not in our target Teddington area. Yeah, keep at it, Lisa. Search? Anything? No, nothing. I've been around Teddington Station, all around the area. Ticket clerk doesn't recall seeing anyone of her description. No sign of Susan Harrington. I mean, she's been missing since 8 o'clock this morning. him from the CCTV scan. Repeat, we have a name. His name is Thomas Frank, leading light in the Amateur Dramatic Society. Home address is 18 Kingsmead Road, Shepparton. Repeat, 18 Kingsmead Road.
Mrs. Frank, Metropolitan Police. This is DCI Roisin Connor. I'm Detective Chief Superintendent Michael Walker. May we come in, please? What, what, what's about? What's happened? Always in connection with your son. You do have a son, a Thomas Frank, is that correct? Yes. Is he at home? Mrs. Frank, we really do need to talk to your son as a matter of urgency. You've got to come in. Thanks. Yeah, no police record, not even a parking fine. Ah, oh, let's get over to his shop. I bet you his mother's already tipped him off. Oh, Christ, I hope we got the right guy. I mean, two kids, lovely home, doting mother. Yeah, who claims a son has never had a broken wrist, left or right. Mr. Frank. What's happened? Has there been an accident? Thomas Frank. Yes. I'm Detective Chief Superintendent Michael Walker. This is DCI Roisin Connor. Can we have a talk? Is it my mother? Dear God, has something happened to her? Inside the shop, please, sir. I don't want to do this on the pavement. My children, my daughters, are they all right? Yes, they are. Could you come into the shop, please, sir? Just a few questions. Yeah, yes, yes, of course. Uh, this way. I'd like you to have a look at this photograph, if you will. Is this you? Y yes. Mr. Frank, we've been asking for you to come forward in order to help us with our inquiry into the whereabouts of Mark Harrington. What? You were in Covent Garden the day he went missing. Uh, do you have a room in the back, sir, where we can talk to you in private? Uh, yes, uh, this way. I'm sorry, I never read the papers. Early mornings are always my busy time, opening up here or buying in the market. If, if I'd known, I mean, known you were looking for me, I'd have made contact straight away. I'm so sorry. Why do you wear a wig, Mr Frank? <laughs> I was going to try and get some plugs done, but I never got round to it. I used to be blonde when I was younger. Stupid male vanity. Mm. But I really don't see how I can help you. I, I never saw this poor chap. I mean, I, I was there. I, I do sometimes go to Covent Garden at weekends. I'm interested in theatre. There's the museum, and I like wandering around the market stalls. What's the matter with your wrist? I'm sorry? In the photograph, you had a plaster cast on your wrist. Oh, that, yes. Well, it's not actually a plaster cast, it's a brace. Sometimes, lifting the heavy grocery boxes, I get terrible strain, so I, I use it when I'm not working. And the injuries in your right wrist? I have what they call tendonitis. In your right wrist? I have it in both wrists. So I sometimes wear it on my right to ease the pain, or, or on my left. <laughs> it's not too bad at the moment, so I'm not wearing it. What time did you go to work this morning? Well, um, I'm always here between 7.30 and 8, um, unpacking and setting up the flowers. We open at 8.30. I have a young lad that helps me out, Eddie. Yeah, what do you go right down the back? There, Mr. Frank. Th that's the yard where I park up my van, and, and uh, the outhouses where I store all the supplies. Do you, do you want to look around? Yes, please. Yes? I I'll get the keys. Yeah. What do you think? Far too helpful. This is where I store all the supplies. <laughs> It's a bit dark, I'm afraid. I keep meaning to get a cable out here for some electricity. <laughs> Not got around to it. Oh, yeah, it, it, it's cats. I keep trying to keep them out here, but they get on the roof. And I can't use too much disinfectant as I have to protect the vegetables. Um, do you want to go inside? Yeah. Lisa, hi. Yeah, I've got a Morris van. It's a grey, green, sort of colour, red, Romeo Delta Lima 200 Hotel. Yeah, check it out for me, will you? See if it was in the Teddington area. Yeah, one of our Gatsby cameras might have picked it up. Yeah, appreciate it. Bye. Ah, do you want to look in the van? Uh, yes, please. Could you open the rear doors for me? Certainly. There. If there's anything I can do to help, I'm just so sorry I didn't come forward before, but, as I say, I don't have much time to read the papers. Or watch TV. Well, I have two teenager daughters, so we mostly watch videos. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr Frank. You've been most helpful. Sorry to have disturbed you. Thank you. Thank you.
you go back to his house to get a search warrant. With what? We bugger all to bring him in on. What the hell has Susan Harrington got to? Walker. What? Good. Good. Right. We are going to his house. Take a left, left again. We're going back. Mr. Francis Morris Van was parked opposite Teddington Station at 9 o'clock this morning, all one identical. Didn't get a registration number, but it's too much of a bloody coincidence. Let's get him in for questioning. Yeah, and let's get a warrant and search that house. I knew it! I knew he was lying! He was too ruddy helpful. Why are you doing this to me? Why? What am I supposed to have done? I told you everything I know, I swear to you. Mrs. Frank. What's this about? Please tell me. I don't understand what's going on. Why have you taken Tom away? Just for questioning. About what? Uh, Miss Frank, could you direct me to your son's bedroom, please? Anything? Yeah, I've got a scrapbook with his theatrical endeavors, some stage makeup, a wig, and this. Looks like a plaster cast, but it's got a steel rod in it to keep his arm steady. You could whack someone over the head with this. Well, like Ted Bundy. Shit. It's really well thumbed. He's even marked up some passages. Thank you very much, Tom. Raymond. Oh, Thank you? goodness you came, yes. So no problem. Sorry, it took a while. Uh, if he has snatched Susan Harrington away in God's name, is she? And where is her husband? I know we searched outside the garage, the garden, nothing. We're going to have to start talking to him and fast. Right. Will Tom be home for dinner? I doubt it, Mrs. Frank. He may not be back for some considerable time. He's helping us with our inquiries. Sh should I get Eddie to open up the shop? He can't be left alone for very long. I don't know what to do. All the vegetables are fresh from the market. I don't know what I should do, because they're perishable. Oh, Mrs Frank, can you call someone? Come and stay with you. Um, Marjorie, my daughter-in-law. I'll call her, and then I'll get Eddie to sort out the shop. Good. He was there this morning. Gave me some nice cherry tomatoes. I was going to make a salad. Mrs. Frank, could you repeat that, please, about Eddie? He was at the shop this morning. Where's your son? Mr. Frank wasn't in the shop this morning, as he said he was. We gotta get someone over to Eddie Conway, kid who works for him. Right, let's get back to the station. We're wasting time. Susan Hannington has got to be somewhere, and we've got to bloody know if she's dead or alive. <sighs> right, let's move. And they also say that it's a bad thing. Thomas Frank for 20 years and I find your accusations against him absolutely preposterous. You don't have a single shred of evidence to link him either to the disappearance of Mr. Harrington or in fact to the disappearance of his wife Susan. All you have it seems to me is that my client wears a wig which is not against the law and that he shops in Covent Garden also not against the law and that he failed to come forward to eliminate himself from your inquiry into the disappearance of Mr. Harrington. You brought him here, and he has now been here for some three hours. If you do have any concrete evidence, kindly disclose it now, as I see no reason whatsoever why you should keep him for another minute, not even for questioning. Your client lied to us. He claimed he was at his workplace, the greengrocer shop, at 9 o'clock this morning. No, 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 no. What my client actually said was that his usual working hours are between 8.15 and closing time. 
His helper, Mr... Eddie. Edward Conway. Helps out a few hours, midweek and at weekends. He was here this morning at my client's request while Mr Frank was doing some stock taking. And Mr Frank was at work, in actual fact, as from 10.30. His van was parked outside Teddington Station. And did your witness actually get the registration mark of my client's van? Do you have any evidence that it was actually my client's van? I'm sure you'll agree there must be any number of old vans of the same make and very similar colour. It's actually a very common colour for that make of vehicle. You said that uh, my client was seen by a witness with Mrs Harrington. Fantastic. Why don't we save each other's time? I suggest you organise an identity parade in which my client is happy to participate with or without the wig he sometimes wears. Can you tell me why these pages, these specific pages, have been underlined? The book refers to Ted Bundy, an American serial killer. The pages involved are detailing how, with the aid of a plaster cast on his arm, he was able to lure people into his car. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, there is actually a very simple explanation for this. My client is, as you may or may not know, a leading member of the local amateur dramatic society. These passages have been marked here for a role that he was researching as... Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Todd. I believe you also have photographs of him as Malvolio in Twelfth Night, wearing a wig not altogether dissimilar to the one that he... There'll be an identity parade here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Oh, shit, we're wasting bloody time. He's not sure he knows where she is. We should have pushed for more, Mike. Not when Mark come in there, we don't stand a snowball's chance in hell. Bands from the council. Look, it goes right out here behind the shop, and there are stairs around here somewhere getting down to the cellar. We must have missed an access door. Yeah, apparently it was all old stables above. Maybe the cellars were used to store feed, but Frank owns the lot. What are we waiting for? Let's go. <laughs> behind these boxes. Smell you get in a mortuary.
don't know how many people are down there. I've never seen anything like it. I'm going to have nightmares for the rest of my life. Do you think any of those bodies in there could be Mr. Gordon's grandson? Oh, Christ, I don't want to go home. I want to speak to my solicitor. Probably Jimmy Gordon. Show sure what they find in his pockets. Army badges. Yeah. Uh, listen, his grandfather, I, I don't want him to be identifying the boy's remains. Um, let's just show him the clothes, yeah? Yeah, they're pretty disintegrated. Well, the badges, then, they're fine. Oh, it's over now. At least he's got closure. How's Susan Harrington? Um... I don't know. Um, I'll call the hospital. How do you think Jean's holding up? You know, Jean, she doesn't show much. But that's a hellhole. Stench. Stench. I'll see you back at the station, yeah? Yeah. Oh. You okay? Yeah, yeah. I'm, um, I'm just gonna wait and talk to Jean. My son is the same age that kid was when he died. If it had happened to him, I'd have killed that bastard with my bare hands. It's the trouble with his job. Rips your heart out. Have a pew. Um, I'm not going to stay long. I'm, I've got to get back to the station and, you know, wash. Pretty bad smell down there. These are strong enough to make your eyes water. <laughs> Thank you. I suppose they all starve to death. Most mortem may tell us more. The young boy. Yeah. If it is Jimmy Gordon, he went missing seven years ago. The other two bodies, they may be girls who went missing three years later. All of them last seen in Covent Garden. God, it's sickening, isn't it? Mm. And to keep the bodies. I mean, what makes a mind twist to that extent? <sighs> I think you've seen it all and can't be shot, but this. A die like that is terrible. Well, it's worst nightmare. Hard to imagine how it must have been finding the other skeletons, especially for your girl. What's her name? Susan Harrington. She that last body that came out it was her husband's. They were on honeymoon, you know. She kept searching for him and she ends up here. Found him there, didn't she? At least you're in time for her. 
I'll let you know what I think when I finished here. Gov, Mrs. Thorpe's in there waiting for you. Sorry, she insisted. She wouldn't take no for an answer. Okay, thanks. Mrs. Thorpe, how can I help you? My daughter died at 8 o'clock this morning. She never regained consciousness. All I could do was hold her hand, but you see, she had no will to live. So whatever happens from now on is immaterial. It won't bring her back. Or my husband. Mrs. Thorpe, I am so very sorry. Yes. Yes, you should be very sorry. You see, I've come here to tell you personally, specifically you, that I hold you and everyone here responsible because, as Susan said, no, she kept on saying, you never believed her fears that Mark had been abducted. Well, um, at least they will be buried together. I hope you have a conscience. Uh, attention, everyone. Uh, Susan Harrington died this morning. We were too late. Right, everybody. Tom Franks, the solicitor, has just appeared, so while he's talking to his client, I suggest we get ourselves prepared. Oh, he hasn't admitted to anything. Yeah, I know, but at least he's not acting up like he's mentally deranged. Thank God for that. I know it's sick, but I'm going to enjoy watching this smug bastard's face. So you've arrested my client. I hope you've organised an identity parade. We've had a few developments since yesterday evening, Mr Markham. Good. We recovered four bodies from your client's cellar. We also discovered Susan Harrington locked in there with them. Susan died this morning. That's five murders we're investigating. And you just think that if, if you had got your client to tell the truth last night rather than that load of bullshit, Susan Harrington could well be alive now. I got in last night and she was asleep. I couldn't resist picking her up. And she's so tiny, her head fits right in the palm of my hand. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect shape. And we just stood there rocking her, you know? Didn't want to let go. Sir, she got a second. You fancy coming in on Frank's interview with me? Only I don't think Roisin's too keen. Mike, can you ask someone else? I want to take my paternity leave. No, I don't think I can deal with all this sickness right now. I'm sorry. Thanks. Let's do it, Mike. Susan Harrington came of her own free will. What reason did you give her to warrant her freely agreeing, as you say, to be taken? Correction. I did not say taken. I said she agreed willingly to come with me. There is a difference. Why did Susan agree? She wanted to be with her husband, and I was concerned for her. But he was dead, and you knew that. I am sick of your attitude. You say you were concerned for her. She was unconscious when we found her. That was not my fault. You should have got to her sooner, and it's the same with the others. If you'd been doing the job you're paid to do, none of them would have died. James Gordon was 15 years old. Whatever excuses you were giving to justify Susan Harrington being held captive... He collected old army badges. He wanted to accompany me because I used to collect them too. He also came of his own free will. And you starved him to death? Why? He knew who I was. Do you enjoy watching James die? It took a long time. Uh, yeah, I suppose I did. 
Yes, in retrospect, it was enjoyment of knowing that I could, if I wanted, to save him. But I chose not to. Self-preservation. Did you get sexual gratification from holding a victim's captive? That was never my incentive. You don't understand. Understand what exactly? The power of watching life diminish, knowing you could, if you wanted, relight it. Like a candle. I ordered some pizza and sandwiches for lunch, Gov. I'm not hungry, thanks. A cup of tea would be nice. Hey, you were on the money with a Bundy call. Frank conned them into that van, whacked them on the head, into the cellar of the shop, and let them starve to death one by one. Nothing sexual, he said. He never raped them or abused them. As if that somehow makes it all acceptable. He just watched and waited for them to die. DCI Connor's been sick in the toilets. Yeah, so is Frank's a solicitor. We're gonna be another day. Maybe more. If you need me in for the statements, I don't mind. I think it will be educational. Educational? Lisa, you don't ever forget it. It clings to you for the rest of your life, believe me, like ghosts. You never know when the memories are gonna rear up and grab you. Not by the throat, but in your heart. And you always ask yourself the same question, should I have done more? I'll go and get you both some tea. I'm just never gonna forgive myself, like. I'm not doing more for Susan Harrington. Don't ever apportion blame. You must never do that. You did your job. Not well enough, Mike. She's dead. I toast to my daughter, oh, yeah. who is getting Thank christened you. tomorrow. That's brilliant. Very brilliant. Very oh, no, you've already got some. Oh, no. <laughs> You're right. Come on. <laughs> Thanks. Well done. Nice one. Hi, mate. <laughs> <laughs> to Abigail. Abigail. And don't laugh. Edna, Charlotte, Mary, Elizabeth, yeah. Satchel. Yeah. <laughs> Let's all get down the pub before she gets on the blow. As my lord knows, last month the defendant entered pleas of guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility, and the Crown was given time to consider these pleas. As I know my lord is aware, four psychiatrists have seen the defendant on a number of occasions, and each has submitted a full report, two for the Crown and two for the defence. Yes, Mr Harper Knowles, I've read these reports. All four psychiatrists agree that the defendant suffers from paranoid schizophrenia and that in their view this is a case of diminished responsibility. My Lord, since the evidence relating to mental condition is, uh, in shorthand terms, all one way, the Crown takes the view that therefore it is not in the public interest for a trial to take place on that issue. I hope that meets with my Lord's approval. I'm not sure that it does, Mr Harper Knowles. You do not say, do you, that no alternative view of the defendant's mental condition is possible? Uh, my lord, the combined opinion of the psychiatrist... You'll forgive me for cutting you short, but it seems clear to me that there is here a triable issue. As you correctly put it, psychiatrists express opinion. I note that the principal source of information on which their opinions are based is the defendant himself. Now, whether the defendant is schizophrenic or not is a matter for a jury to decide. All the 
several bodies were semi-clothed, and there were items of clothing distributed around the cellar, which you can find in pictures numbered two, three, and seven in police album number two. A severe dehydration can cause delusion, resulting in the removal of clothing despite low temperatures. There were scratch marks on the wall, both in an area close to body A, which I photographed, and around a small grating higher up, which appeared to have been made by human hands. Now, as you will see, there was considerable damage to the hands on all the bodies, which could have been made by clawing at the wall. In another part of the cellar were the two female bodies, B and C. There were associated vessels nearby which had contained urine, and on these vessels there were fingerprints matching the girls, as well as saliva stains, which seemed to indicate that they'd been used to drink. Uh, the fourth body, D, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but D was later identified as Mark Harrington, I believe? Yes, that is correct. Body D had died more recently than the others. I understand there was a wound to the head which seemed to indicate he had received a sharp blow. The body was partially decomposed and near to the body there were obvious human feces. Susan had been walking around the Covent Garden area day after day, leaving just after it was light and not getting back until the evening. She wouldn't eat anything. She looked thinner and more gaunt every day. When was the last time you saw her, Mrs Thorpe? Do you recall? Of course. It was on the Tuesday morning. I asked her where she was going, but she wouldn't say. I think she was worried I might tell the police. She'd become quite disillusioned with them. She felt they were treating Mark's disappearance as a routine matter. I appreciate it may have seemed like that, Mrs Thorpe, but you don't see all the inquiries which are going on. So, you last saw Susan on the Tuesday. Nevertheless, if the police had managed to establish a proper rapport with my daughter, she would never have gone off on her own. When a woman was appointed to head up the investigation... Difficult as it undoubtedly was for both you and Susan, I, I really must insist... I had hoped that DCI Connor would empathise more with Susan, that communication would improve. But, tragically, this was not the case. Let us grasp the nettle. How usual would it be for anyone to allege this, urging them to do what they have done? Well, that's a question frequently put to psychiatrists, but a professional diagnosis will not follow from just a single symptom. You recognise as a psychiatrist that patients will often try to pull the wool over your eyes. Yes, of course. Over the years, he's managed to conceal from those around him not only his voices, but any sign of mental illness at all. True? Yes, but this is in itself a symptom. The paranoid schizophrenic is extraordinarily cunning extremely involved in premeditation and determined not to be found out. A very great proportion of normal criminals are also cunning, clever and anxious not to be found out. <laughs> this isn't the hallmark of the schizophrenic, it's the hallmark of the normal criminal. This pattern is the badge of the premeditating killer, is it not? No, I don't accept that. Look, uh, as far as I can see, in this particular case, he's either a highly competent actor or I am we are uh, quite deficient as psychiatrists. That is not for any of us to decide. It is for the jury. Do you enjoy watching James die? It took a long time. Uh, yeah, I suppose I did. Yes, in retrospect, it was enjoyment of knowing that I could, if I wanted, to save him. But I chose not to. Self-preservation. Did you get sexual gratification from holding a victim's captive? That was never my incentive. You don't understand. Understand what exactly? The power of watching life diminish, knowing you could, if you wanted, relight it. Like a candle.
So, Mr. Frank, it comes to this. You fully accept that what you did brought about the deaths of the four people found in your cellar, is that correct? Yes. And that is what you intended should happen? Yes. I knew that must happen if no one came to their aid. Of course I knew it. So what about Susan Harrington? Was it your intention that she should die as well? I explained to her about the rehypnol and she wanted to take it so she could see her husband. She took the drug so that she wouldn't know where she'd been when I let her go. That's what I was going to do. Let her go. So did she form any part of what you described to the psychiatrist as your mission? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I felt sorry for her. And when I saw her appeal on TV, I felt I needed to help her to cope with her loss. It's called closure, I believe. Will you please tell the jury, in your own words, how all this came about? This mission you've said you were on, what started it? It's what I told all those doctors because they wanted to know. I first heard the voices in my head when my father died. He died of heart problems. But what killed him was his weight. When he died, he was nearly 26 stone. Yes, and the voices? I looked at him, <clears throat> right there on his deathbed, and I felt this cold sensation. I could hear this voice saying, the sin of gluttony has taken his soul. How old were you then? Just 20. But the voices stayed with me through my 20s and 30s, getting louder and clearer. They were telling me that I must atone for my father's sin of gluttony. For all the gluttony you can see everywhere now. Thanks. His father died of lung cancer, not obesity. I just can't listen to any more of that creature's madness. Great. That's exactly what we don't want proved. You want Tom Frank to get down for the rest of his life? Better start praying that Harper Nose can convince that jury that he's sane. The voices said, I had to expiate the sin of gluttony. <laughs> I had to look expiate up in the dictionary to be sure what it meant. Man should go without food or water for 40 days and 40 nights. That's what they kept telling me. And that I had to find that person. What person? Just somebody. Anybody. It didn't matter who. So I found someone in Covent Garden, where I used to go quite a lot. This boy collected army badges, and I said I had just what he was looking for in a box in my cellar, and he came with me. I locked him in easily, and the voices said that God was pleased and would take him to himself, and the uh, gluttony would recede. He came in back in. All that crap about God's mission. You know, the Yorkshire Ripper did the same. They're discussing the kid with the army badges. I'm going. Mr. Frank, did you also mention this mission to the police officers when they interviewed you? No, I did not. They would not have understood. But you do recall telling all the doctors about it? Yes. I was very relieved when it was over, and I felt free again. I went on running my business, doing what I do best. But then they came back. The voices got louder and more persistent, and told me I had to do the same thing again. It's all a terrible waste of life, but I know I have to do what he tells me. He? God. These are God's works. God's instructions, and I have to follow them. That's the mission he's given me. And is your mission now complete? He still talks to me, and I hear him now more than ever. But <laughs> he'll have to find someone else now. I'm no use to him where I'm going. I can't stand to see that man smiling and gloating. I want him to be punished. 
But if they send him to prison, I will locking him up in a cell for the rest of his life, compared to what he did to my young grandson. Not fair. Not right. And if he's mad, it'll be Rampton. With this monster and his mission, he'll probably walk free after a few years. Where's the justice in that? I'm sorry. Um, thank you for all you've done. Uh, no, I'm so sorry. I know this must be very hard for you. Mm. All these years, I felt maybe I could have done more. And I'm still thinking about what I should have done. Well, maybe I've thought enough. Let me see if I understand you correctly. You were on a divine mission, were you? God was telling you to provide him with, uh, in effect, human sacrifices, hmm? I am on God's mission, and he has spoken to me. Thy will be done. And were you the only person tuned into this divine mission control? You should not mock me. I do not mock you, Mr. Frank. I'm asking you questions to which this jury here will want an answer. Let me move on then. A book with a label on it stating the price as 15 pounds 99 pence was found in your house. Did you buy this book? Look at me, please, Mr. Frank. Did you buy this book? Was it God's idea or yours to buy a book about Ted Bundy? Of course, you know who we mean by Ted Bundy. He was a notorious serial killer, convicted of numerous murders in the United States in 1980. But you know that, don't you? You read about it, and you decided to copy him, hmm? Didn't you? Ted Bundy cajoled his victims into trusting him by wearing a plaster cast on his arm, exactly as... Ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. St. John, chapter 8, verse 23. The five people you locked into your cellar are no longer of this world either. I would remind you, Mr. Frank, that the jury will be judging you, not St. John. Now, for one final time, will you answer my question? Or will you maintain this charade? You heard no voices, received no instructions, neither divine nor of any kind, did you? You did what you did to those poor souls for your own disgusting purpose, did you not? The jury is waiting for your answer. You say that Susan Harrington had agreed to go with you and be drugged by you. But what did you intend should happen to her then? Nothing. Nothing? What do you mean, nothing? No food, no water, that sort of nothing? I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall not hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. But I say unto ye that ye have seen me and yet believe not. St. John, chapter 6, verses 35 and 36. Whether you are believed or not, Mr. Frank, will be a matter for this jury. All over by the closing speeches. What do you think the jury will go for? Mad or bad? Oh, I honestly don't know. I do think Harper Knowles was very impressive, though. Yeah, he was. He'll be even better today. Mm. This is for you. I finally managed to get the money for your New York plane tickets. Oh, thanks. You can take that break you wanted. No, after this, I think we both need one. Mm. You going with someone? No, on my own, by myself. Here we have a man who donned a wig and a plaster cast to stalk Covent Garden Market for his victims. A man who, when brought to account in the witness box, could give no satisfactory answer to any question he was asked. A dangerous man who was the leading light of his local amateur dramatic society and who, with much theatricality, has sought to con each one of you with his own brand of claptrap. Whilst doctors will instinctively seek to give human aberration a recognized medical label, they cannot define medically what we would instinctively describe as wickedness. 
of the most heinous sort. Now, when you have considered the evidence and followed my Lord's directions on the law, we invite you to conclude that Frank's responsibility for his deeds was in no sense diminished, and that what has been proved in this courtroom is murder, pure and simple. In the end, the decisive question for you is this. Do you think it more probable than not that each time he killed, he acted under a deluded belief that he was on some divine mission? If so, that amounts to diminished responsibility. See, you as laymen and women are being asked to fathom the deepest recesses of an undoubtedly troubled mind. But you've listened to four vastly experienced psychiatrists all were in complete agreement, all concluding that this man was and is suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. And you can rest assured that if a reputable psychiatrist could be found anywhere in the land to judge Mr. Frank anything remotely approaching sane, the Crown would have found him and he would have been called to this witness box to testify in front of you. Right. I think it's best if we just go around the table again. I'd really appreciate it if we all concentrated and listened. We have all been listening, but we've been here for hours. I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted. We're here to determine whether he's crazy or not. And I, for one, don't care if he's mad or bad. The man should be strung up from the... That man is a total bastard. I don't care what he tries on or what we're supposed to think about his mental state. He's a murderer. I think he needs care and treatment. In prison... I mean, we all know what's going to happen, don't we? The doctors and the social workers will be tricked into letting him out early and he'll kill again. Only thing we have to decide is whether he's suffering from schizophrenia or not. What we have here is a perverse, twisted mind, not necessarily a severely unbalanced. I didn't understand a lot of what that doctor was saying. I mean, he thinks he's sick, doesn't he? And he's a doctor. He knew exactly what he was doing. But that doesn't mean he's not a schizophrenic. That's what the whole case is about. All right, can we just go around the table so that I can write it down? Is he mad or bad? Keep it simple and let's get out of here. Bad. 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 He has to be mad. Mr. Foreman, have the jury reached verdicts on all counts upon which you are all agreed? We have. Members of the jury, on count one, do you find the defendant, Thomas Frank, guilty or not guilty of murder? Guilty. On count two, do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty of murder? Guilty. Oh, yes. On count three, do you find the defendant guilty, guilty. or not on count guilty four? Murder? Guilty. On count five? Guilty. Thomas Frank, you snatched these five innocent people from their walks of life, away from those who loved them, and you locked them up and left them to die with not so much as a glass of water for succor. What wicked, depraved, and sadistic tendencies you had, only you can know. You have plumbed the very depths of inhumanity. And the cruelty you displayed to your victims will have shaken to the very core every single person who's had to listen to this evidence. Your last victim was cynically tricked by you into joining her newly wed husband in the place where you'd incarcerated him. You had starved him to death as you had the other unfortunate souls whose paths so tragically crossed yours. In respect of each one of counts one to four, I pass upon you the sentence I'm required to by law and that is a sentence of life imprisonment. On count five, there will equally be a sentence of life imprisonment. 
I express my hope that when I've said life imprisonment, it will mean precisely that, and that you remain in prison for the rest of your natural days. Take him down. A new ITV drama continues next Monday and Tuesday at 9. It's a compelling story of a complex love triangle with a tragic twist. Tamsin Outhwaite, Julie Graham and Mark Strong star in this moving story of life, love and temptation. Walk Away and I Stumble, brand new to ITV1, next Monday and Tuesday at 9. Coming next tonight, it's the ITV News at 10.30.